Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Convergence of Wetland Tech and Science webinar, uh, where we'll be talking about the updates and future of NWI and NWCA. We will give a few moments to let people filter in, and we will kick this off. Thank you so much for coming. All right, well, good afternoon and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, as I said, this is the 18th edition of our webinar, webinar series on the convergence of wetland tech and science. Uh, my name is Cameron Davis and I'm the business development rep here at Ecobot. Uh, so today's topic is updates and future of NWI and NWCA. We've got a great panel of experts with us today who will be introduced in just a few minutes. Once we kick things off, we're eager to have a two-way dialogue during the presentation as well. So down at the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see a Q&A button. Please use that to ask any questions that you'd like to have answered by our panel, and we'll field them directly towards the end. Uh, also note, we're recording the webinar, and everyone who registered will get a follow-up email later this week linking you to the video so you can rewatch and share if you'd like. Our host today is my colleague with nearly two decades of experience as a wetland scientist and also the co-founder and chief scientist here at Ecobot, Jeremy Shavey. So Jeremy, I'll hand it off to you and go ahead and get started. Great, thank you, Cameron. And uh, welcome everyone, welcome back for those of you who have participated in this webinar series in the past. And for those of you who are here for your first time, welcome. Uh, we really enjoy this community forum and being able to bring what's really important to us as wetland scientists um, out into the public, um, especially into the regulatory and consulting community, as well as those that we serve. Um, so today I'm very excited. This is a, uh, uh, this is a webinar that has been in the visioning for over a year. Um, taking a look at the National Wetlands Inventory as well as the National Wetlands Condition Assessment Project. Um, and so we'll just go ahead and jump in. And for those of you who have come in a little bit late, just to note that down at the bottom of the screen, you can put questions that can be uh, asked to the panel and presenters down in the Q&A button down at the bottom. Um, and we will, I will try to curate those as best as possible as we go. So let's go ahead and get started. I think one of the things that I wanted to do most kick us off here today is just a little reminder of why we do this. One of the things that I've enjoyed most about my uh, professional uh, relationship with all of our panelists today is that sometimes we remind each other that sometimes it's really easy to get pigeonholed into one particular aspect or function that we are serving in respect to conservation, planning, geospatial science, um, or just the sciences in general. This past weekend, I was out camping in the mountains with my wife here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. We had an extremely warm weekend. We were laying out by the fire and just looking up and seeing all the stars in the tops of the trees. And just, I was just, some part of me just melted. I was just like, oh yeah. This is why I do all these busy things and why I cram my head into all of these functions and doing and doing. And I know most of us here on this call can identify with that. And so I just wanna say thank you for being a part of the community that is looking out for the betterment of our future and to better understand how to manage the natural resources, both in wetlands and streams, et cetera, that our country is so blessed with. And um, I believe it's, it's, our, it's our role here to continue that forward. So a little synopsis of what we're gonna be actually looking at here today. Um, I'm gonna to give a very high, after I introduce everyone briefly from the panel and the presenters, uh, I'm gonna give a very high level uh, uh, comparison of the National Wetlands Condition Assessment and the National Wetlands Inventory. Um, and then we're gonna jump right in. Greg's gonna give us a great presentation on uh, what's going on up until this moment with the NWCA. 
And then Megan is also going to then be doing the same thing with the National Wetland Inventory. I will summarize it all at the end and kind of tie it back into the industry. Um, we'll give a very brief plug for our webinar for uh, uh, January, and then uh, we'll jump into the uh, Q&A and discussion at the end. So again, welcome everyone. Happy holidays. Hope you're going to enjoy the time that you're going to have with your families or whatever else it is that you do with your time. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, very excited uh, to be working with Megan Lang from uh, Chief Scientist with US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, head of the NWI, and Greg Sarenbatz, who is the uh, Head of the uh, National Wetland, or the lead for the National Wetlands Condition Assessment. Um, so they are our, our primary speakers today. But we also have Rob McLeod from Ducks Unlimited, uh, Lindsay Reynolds from the uh, Bureau of Land Management, and Gina O'Neill joining us from Esri. And we'll get a little bit deeper into the sharing later in our conversation um, why they are important players in this conversation today as well. Let's go ahead and dive in. National Wetlands Condition Assessment versus National Wetland Inventory. Okay, Megan and Greg both asked me, okay, wait, 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 which one is on the right? Which one's on the left? Not important. What is most important is understanding how these two amazing federal resources are working both individually as well as together to give us a better understanding, to give us better data sets, to give us a better idea of what the condition and what the future of the wetlands in our country may be looking like. And I know for myself personally, I was using NWI right before getting onto this webinar for a project that I'm working on up in, in Kentucky right now. Um, very, very active utilization of this data. So one of the most important things that uh, we wanted everyone to take away today, if you did not already know this, is both of these projects, both, the, both of these monitoring projects, as well as uh, uh, data collection, are not meant to establish jurisdictional boundaries in respect to 404 or 401 water quality certification projects. Etc. However, they are frequently used for these types of projects to give uh, consultants and regulators a better understanding of what might be in the field before going out. Understand a level of effort, um, but not necessarily meant to establish those regulatory boundaries from a jurisdictional perspective. So with that said, while I love to spend boots on the ground, sometimes it's really important to take a look at things from a macro level, from a geospatial level. And so I am pleased to introduce Greg Sarenbetz from EPA and have him give us a little bit of an update of what's going on with the National Wetland Condition Assessment Project. So Greg, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, you just let me know when you want to advance the slide and I will yeah. be on mute unless you call me otherwise. Okay, great, thanks, Jeremy. And uh, just, uh, can you hear me okay? All right, uh, I did, I just lost my internet connection. <laughs> so re-signed on and uh, if it happens again, hopefully I'll be able to reconnect uh, uh, quickly. Um, but just in case you do lose me, I'll, I'll try to get back on uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so first I just wanna thank uh, Jeremy, oh, uh, uh, well, introduce myself. So yeah, as Jeremy mentioned, I'm Greg Sarenbetz. I uh, work at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on an uh, initiative called the National Wetland Condition Assessment. I've been with EPA for uh, 15 years and worked pre predominantly on the NWCA for the last 10. Really excited to be here to give a little um, bit of an overview on the project and really appreciate Jeremy um, uh, setting up uh, this forum for us to all have uh, this great discussion. So I'll start with some background on the National Wetland Condition Assessment. The, this is an initiative under the Clean Water Act to conduct statistical surveys that assess and report on the ecologic condition of the nation's wetlands. Uh, condition is assessed by evaluating biological, physical, and chemical properties of wetlands and deriving indicators of condition based on field and lab sampling data. 
Uh, it's implemented through collaboration with state and tribal wetland agencies and federal partners. Uh, we, we work really closely with the Natural Resources Conservation Survey soil scientists. They provide really crucial support to the survey. The Fish and Wildlife Service has provided us with wetland maps, uh, additional support in access to fish and wildlife uh, refuges across the country. Uh, and then we've worked with the National Park Service and BLM on identifying uh, handpicked sites that we use to further uh, characterize uh, reference sites. And so um, I know Lindsay Reynolds is on the panel today. And uh, just this year, we actually had a really nice, um, we basically got a really nice set of sites uh, that they're also sampling. Uh, and so we've got, uh, we'll have data from the two different survey approaches that we use. Um, the surveys are conducted every five years. First one was in 2011. Uh, we followed up that one up with one in 2016. Uh, and then we just completed our last, sur uh, our latest survey this uh, summer. Uh, it's conducted across the 48 conterminous United States, uh, but have included special studies in Alaska's North Slope in 2011. Uh, and then we also did sampling in the Pacific Island territories uh, this past summer, and we'll be doing some more sampling uh, there next year. Uh, it's one of four companion surveys under the umbrella of EPA's National Aquatic Resource Surveys, uh, or NARS. Uh, we're also conducting surveys of lakes, rivers, streams, and coastal waters. Uh, next slide. Uh, next, I'd like to cover a few key components of uh, NWCA. Uh, NWCA uses a statistically based design that allows the results to be extrapolated to the entire population in the conterminous US. Uh, this is much like a health or public opinion survey would pull a small sample of the population and then use those results to estimate national values with a known margin of error. Uh, 1,000 sites are sampled each survey cycle. Uh, 25 to 30% of the sites each cycle are sampled across four successive cycles. Uh, so for example, uh, we sampled 250, um, about 270 sites in 2016, uh, and those sites will also be sampled uh, in 2021, 2026, and 2031. Uh, NWC includes tidal and non-tidal and fresh and saltwater wetlands. Uh, the sampling protocols are specifically developed to be conducted during a one-day in-field sampling visit, uh, which does limit the types of data that can be collected. Uh, the same protocols are, um, are conducted, though, at all sites across the country. Next slide. So uh, NWCA has re relied extensively on the wetland mapping provided by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Wetland Inventory and their status and trends programs. Uh, since Megan Lang is going to be providing an update on those programs later in the session, I wanted to spend a bit of time discussing how exactly NWC uses the information from NWI. Uh, so NWI is the source of wetland maps used to select sites in NWCA. We take the national digital data set of all mapped wetlands in the US and categorize every wetland polygon based on their coordinate and classification codes. Um, for those unfamiliar with the codes or cordon, <clears throat> it's a classification system that describes a particular wetland habitat based on a series of descriptors, including vegetation and hydrologic regimes. Uh, so for example, a PSS1A uh, coded wetland is a palustrine scrub shrub wetland dominated by broadleafed deciduous plants that is temporarily flooded uh, throughout the growing season. Uh, certain cordon classification codes are grouped into seven wetland categories of interest to NWCA because they meet the definition for NW NWCA's target popu uh, population. Uh, and that the, our definition uh, of our target is tidal and non-tidal wetlands within the conterminous U.S. with rooted vegetation and when present shallow open water less than one meter deep that are not currently being used in the production of crops. Uh, so, for instance, a PEM1A wetland would be grouped into NWCA's palustrine emergent or inland herbaceous category. And um, the PSS1A wetland, which I mentioned just recently mentioned, would be grouped into NWCA's palustrine uh, shrub or inland woody category. Uh, other cording classification codes that are unlikely to be wetlands included in the NWCA target definition are grouped into five non-target categories. Uh, for instance, uh, 
an L2 UBH or a lacustrine littoral unconsolidated bottom permanently flooded wetland would be grouped into a uh, lacustrine other category. And our thinking there is, uh, again, our target population is uh, wetlands that are less than one meter deep. And that particular code uh, generally means that the water body is, uh, is two meters um, at least. Uh, next slide. Uh, so NWCA collects uh, data on biological, chemical, and physical properties of wetlands. Uh, we sample vegetation in five 100 square meter plots uh, at the sites and record information on presence and cover of each vascular plant species, cover of all vascular species by strata, cover of bryophytes, lichens, and algae, uh, tree counts covering snags, and then we also assess ground cover. So looking at percent cover of water, bare ground, litter, and woody debris. Um, we excavate a 125 centimeter deep soil pit and record information on soil morphology, so color, texture, and any redoxomorphic features that are present. Uh, we look at the depth to water table and hydric soil field indicators. Uh, we also collect soil samples to measure physical and chemical properties, uh, such as the percent sand, salt, and clay, uh, nutrients, and metals. Uh, we characterize surface water if it's present and collect a water sample to assess for chemical properties such as pH, conductivity, uh, nutrients, dissolved organic carbon, uh, sulfate chloride. Uh, we look for um, concentrations of the algal toxin microcystin, and we also look at chlorophyll A. Uh, and just want to note about two thirds of our sites have water. So we are. Um, uh, we, are, we do sample waters that, that don't have uh, surface water present, um, at least at, time, at the time of this, the um, field sampling visit. Uh, we also note the presence of any human-mediated physical alterations in six broad categories of disturbance. Uh, these are alterations to vegetation from the removal or replacement of natural wetland communities. Uh, alterations to hydrology from activities that obstruct flow or lead to increases or decreases in water levels, and then alterations to the soil surface from activities that, that compact or harden the soil substrate or result in modifications to the surface topology of the wetland. Uh, so sedimentation or excavation or dredging, for example. Um, most data is collected within a uh, 0.5 hectare area, representing a point location specified in the survey design. A uh, layout can be a circle, a polygon, or a boundary of the wetland uh, if it's less than 0 0.5 hectares. Uh, and these, uh, these layout shapes are dependent on the size, shape, and location of the sampling point within the wetland. Uh, we, also look, uh, at, we also collect physical alteration data at three 100 square meter plots on transects extending 100 meters outwards in each of the cardinal directions, so north, east, west, and south. Um, Next slide. So this is just a map uh, showing the location of sites sampled in NWCA in 2011 and 2016. Um, overall, 1,984 wetland sites have been sampled across the two survey years with 217 that have been sampled in both years. Uh, the shaded areas indicate the different ecoregions that EPA has used to report results in addition uh, to national results. And then um, I just want to note the distribution of sites uh, is a reflection of uh, the differing densities of wetland area across the country. So we have a greater, um, greater number of sites in the areas with a greater percentage of land cover that's wetland. Uh, next slide. Um, so we've completed two surveys for NWCA. Um, we just finished our field season for the third. The compiled field and lab data for the 2011 and 2016 surveys are available to the public and can be accessed on EPA's NWCA webpage. Uh, data from both surveys uh, is used to develop indicators to report on the condition of wetlands at national and regional scales. Uh, we've developed two indicators based on the vegetation data, um, including a vegetation multimetric index and a non-native plants indicator. We've also developed two indicators based on the chemi on chemical analysis of the soil and water samples. Uh, one is a soil heavy metal index that looks at the concentration of 12 metals and compares against background levels. Uh, the other is um, 
is, is looking at microsystem concentration and comparing those against uh, recreational health uh, criteria established by EPA. Uh, we also um, developed six indicators based on the physical alteration data. Um, we have two that are related to the to alterations of vegetation, so uh, removal of vegetation or replacement of vegetation. Uh, we also have um, indicators related to alterations to hydrology, uh, a flow obstruction indicator, and then uh, an indicator related to addition or subtraction of water. Uh, and then two uh, alterations related to the soil, soil um, and surface, uh, one being soil hardening and the other surface modification. The 2011 survey found that 48% of wetland area nationally was in good condition based on vegetation as expressed by the Vegetation Multimetric Index. Uh, and then physical alterations to vegetation, soil compaction and ditching were the most prominent stressors. Uh, the findings from the 2016 survey are currently being prepared um, and should be released next year. Uh, and that concludes my slides. I realized I actually um, forgot to kind of have something on final thoughts and, and future. Um, so uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we just finished our, um, our 2021 field season. Uh, we're in the process of compiling all that data, um, basically, uh, performing quality assurance checks on it. Uh, we'll be putting that all together. And, uh, and like the 2011 and 2016 data, we'll release data files um, that'll be available to the public. Uh, we're looking to have a much quicker turnaround time on those data files. In 2011 and 2016, it took us about um, three to four years to get data out. Uh, we're looking to significantly shorten that time so that we can get data files out within the next year or two. Uh, and then uh, we'll obviously be analyzing the 2016 data uh, in a similar way to what we did for 2011 and 2016. So um, that's those are my slides, Jeremy. Great, thank you, Greg. And again, for people who have come in late, if you have questions for the speakers um, or panelists, you can use the Q&A chat at the bottom to put those questions up. So there's some great questions already coming in. Um, and we will handle those at the end. Um, one thing I noticed, Greg, as, as you were showing the uh, 2011 and 16 slide, uh, maybe I missed something, but there were points that I know that we did in 2011 that weren't showing up. If, if there were there some points that were 2011 and 2016, and so the 2016 just overwrote the code? Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Jeremy, I actually noticed that too, because I was like, wow, it looks like we only had like two sites in Nevada. And it was just the way that I, uh, the way that I created the map, the 2021 sites um, or 16 sites kind of overrode the 2011. Okay. Yeah. So Great. I'm trying to figure out a good way of depicting those, uh, the sites that were sampled in multiple survey years. And that, the graphic I showed, maybe not the best way to do that. Well, it's a, it's a good start. Maybe you could blend the colors. What would that make? Orange then? No. Uh, For this whole yes, one. something like that. Yeah, there we go. Well, Greg, certainly appreciate you joining us here today. And I'm going to go ahead and pivot and bring us over to, uh, to Megan Lang. So, um, so Megan and I have, have been having great conversations for the last few years around the NWI and um, uh, how, how everyone in this industry can help improve that and then also just how important this is to our industry. So Megan, thank you for joining us today and I'd uh, love to just turn it over to you and I'll go ahead and bring us up to your first slide here. Great, Jeremy, thank you very much um, for inviting me and um, for this opportunity to provide a bit more information about the NWI program and its core data sets and our future plans. Um, and also thank you very much, Greg, for that, that great overview of NWCA, NWI and NWCA have um, long worked together to support one another. And, and, and that's really how it should be. Um, Megan, before you jump in, your uh, camera is not on. I'm sure everyone would love to see your lovely mug. One minute, let me fix that. 
All right, thank you. Okay. Right. That better? Thanks. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so you can go ahead and forward it to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to start off this presentation by providing a general introduction into uh, the National Wetlands Inventory Program. Of course, the, the program sits within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the principal U.S. federal agency tasked with providing information to the American public on the extent and trends of U.S. wetlands. We're mandated to produce these data through the Emergency Wetlands Resources Act of 1986. We meet our mandate to map wetlands through production of the NWI geospatial data set and our mandate to track wetland change through provision of wetland status and trends reports to, to Congress and also to the nation. Uh, these two uh, data sets, the geospatial and the status and trends data set, are distinct, but they are they're complementary. And together they provide critical information on wetland and deep water habitat type, location and trends to best support a broad array of decision support needs. So with this presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce status and trends, but I'm really gonna focus on the geospatial data set. And then of course, if you have questions on either, you can always reach out to me. Next slide, please. So in this slide, and then the, the following two slides, I'm gonna briefly provide an overview of status and trends. Uh, the goal of the project is to provide Congress and the nation with current information on the extent of US wetlands and deep water habitats and their change over time. This information um, is really used as um, the yardstick um, that measures the net results of billions of dollars worth of policy and management actions. So for example, it was used to um, measure uh, success of the no net loss policy. Uh, copies of our status and trends reports can be found at our website, which is listed to the lower right. If you don't wanna copy down this information, if you simply um, search for FWS, and NWI online, you'll find our website and then you can quickly navigate to the status and trends section of the website. Next slide, please. So uh, we collect status and trends data by sampling 5,048 four mile square plots that are distributed across the contiguous US, regardless of land ownership. And within those plots, we photo interpret land cover at two different dates to assess change for the study period. We then use statistical analysis to measure wetland and deep water gain, loss, and type conversion. So to the right of this slide, you can see land cover mapped for time one and time two overlaid on images from those respective dates. And so you can see um, that this plot highlights the gain of ponds within a suburbanizing area. Next slide, please. Status and Trends has a long history of catalyzing wetland conservation and in this way, helping to reduce net wetland loss. So for example, our 1984 Status and Trends report generated tremendous interest in wetlands and was the catalyst behind the swamp buster provision of the Food Security Act of 1985. This policy and subsequent related USDA policies have changed agriculture from the biggest driver of wetland loss to supporting a net wetland gain. So that's a huge turnaround. Uh, we are presently collecting data in support of our next report, which we plan to publish in 2023. And this report will cover um, the dates 2009 through 2019. Next slide. So now I'm going to switch topics and I'm going to provide an overview of our wetlands geospatial data set, which is commonly known as NWI maps. Uh, the NWI data set is our nation's most spatially and categorically detailed information on wetlands. It is identified by um, the Federal Geographic Data Committee or FGDC and the Office of Management and Budget 
as the wetlands layer of the national, spa national spatial data infrastructure. Um, and so this might sound like word soup, but what is being implied is that the NWI data set serves an important role within our nation's national spatial data infrastructure, an infrastructure that is intended to create and provide the geospatial knowledge required to understand, protect, and promote America's national and global interests. So this is a, um, a big role for us. Uh, creation of the data set has taken a substantial amount of effort and particular teamwork. Today it is, to date, it has taken um, approximately 40 years and $220 million in support from over 165 contributors to produce our wetlands data layer. Um, the data layer is not static. We work with stakeholders every year to update between 50 and 100 million acres. The figure to the left shows a categorically simplified version of the NWI geospatial data set. Lakes are mapped in dark blue, woody wetlands are mapped in dark green, and wetlands with herbaceous or non-woody vegetation can be seen in light green. Next slide, please. Our data set is frequently relied upon by the American public. Our website is viewed about, 100, um, about 1 million times annually. Each year, our mapper is viewed over half a million times. Uh, and last year, approximately 260 maps were printed using our wetlands mapper. Use of our data set has increased through time, in part evidenced by the bar um, graph to the bottom right. The figure on the left shows the extent of the maps that were printed for Southeast Texas between 2015 and 2019. More maps were printed in areas that are darker green and fewer for areas that are lighter green. So as you can see, NWI maps are heavily used in urban areas like Houston and along transportation corridors like roads, um, but they're also used to support decision-making in more rural areas, such as the area to the north of Corpus Christi. Next slide, please. Due in large part to the flexibility provided by its substantial categorical detail, the NWI data set has been used for a wide variety of applications. For example, our data has been used to assess ecological functions and related ecosystem services, including mitigation of natural disasters, provision of uh, clean water, modulation of hydrologic flows, um, support for nutrient cycling and provision of recreation. And of course, biologists, um, and a lot of the service um, are biologists, uh, use our data to support habitat assessments and species population modeling. Next slide, please. Although the NWI program does not map the proprietary jurisdiction of local, state, and federal government, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, um, our data are regularly used to, um, in a supporting role, uh, and they're used to streamline the planning permitting and mitigation um, actions associated with development while conserving wetlands and their environmental benefits. Uh, NWI is used in this manner by multiple levels of government as well as the private sector. For example, staff with the states of Minnesota and Michigan recently reported that their states use NWI data to enhance the efficiency of state planning and regulatory programs, saving approximately $1,750,000 annually, respectively. The state of Alaska also commonly uses NWI data. So you can see an example of this uh, to the left of that slide. Um, so our data set was used to support planning for the realignment of the Alaska Railroad. Uh, Alaska is the only place in the US or its territories without a complete NWI data set. The Alaska Geospatial Council recently developed a plan to support completion of the NWI data set for Alaska, in part due to their need for wetlands data to support infrastructure development planning. Next slide, please. So our data are well used for a variety of different uh, applications, um, but with the exception of a pulse of funds around 1993, we've had a flat budget for about 40 years. Our primary challenge is and has been to support a complete contemporary data set with a budget that has been flat and thus functionally declining 
uh, for decades. So if we were to track with inflation, we would have a budget of um, over $20 million, but we're, we're flat at our budget of just over uh, 3 million. So we're, we're working towards meeting this challenge um, by leveraging partnerships and advanced technologies. Next slide, please. One important partner for NWI is USGS, more specifically the National Geospatial Program, which produces the National Hydrography Dataset, or NHD. Um, the NWI and National Geospatial Programs are working together to support our nation's most pressing challenges, um, from climate change to water quality to infrastructure development by developing comprehensive contemporary interoperable water data. We're currently working together to modernize and align all aspects of NWI and NHD data management. From planning and outreach, to data um, standards and distributions uh, in order to improve data set utility. Um, so the utility of our data sets to users and to gain cost efficiencies. And doing so will really um, you know, help NWI to best meet the needs of stakeholders now and into the future. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, NWI is working to leverage both partnerships and new technologies to, mess, to best meet the needs of stakeholders. Although um, mapping related technologies are developing rapidly and we're certainly keeping track of that, it is still challenging to accurately map wetlands nationally especially at the fine spatial and categorical resolutions required by our nation's wetland mapping standard. And this is the FGDC standard. NWI's solution is to adaptively manage our targeting, acquisition, and maintenance procedures to leverage the best of all data sets and techniques within a semi-automated framework. We're doing this through our new mapping technologies project. Um, Gina is part of that effort. So hopefully we'll hear more about that later. Um, and this project is a coordinated systematic effort to identify, evaluate, and document the potential of new technologies to guide NWI's future technical direction. The ultimate goal of this effort is faster, cheaper, better NWI data production. So in the next few slides, I'll provide some examples of how uh, the NWI program uses new technologies to enhance targeting and data production. Next slide, please. So um, this is an example of um, NWI difference products. Um, so these products were, um, well, they're an example of how we adaptively manage NWI's targeting and maintenance procedures to leverage the best of different data sets and techniques. Um, a lot of time and high capacity computing has gone into creating the difference products, um, but the gist of how um, the products were created is really very simple. So basically they're created by comparing NWI data to other national land cover data sets, including um, NOAA's CCAP and MRLC's NLCD. Um, and we're doing that in order to identify areas of likely wetland loss and gain since NWI data production. The difference products can be used to help target limited funds towards areas of greatest need. In addition, they provide more current information on wetland status to NWI stakeholders. And another critical need that they fill is enabling the appropriate use of NWI data by highlighting geographies with more and less contemporary data and enabling you, the users, to decide where it is appropriate to use our data to meet your, app, to meet your application needs, to meet your decision support needs. So the data are produced at the pixel scale, um, and that is what you are seeing um, in, in this slide, but they can then be aggregated to the NWI feature scale, the watershed scale, um, or other scales like the census tract scale. Um, note that I'm referring to these products as difference data and not change data. Um, I'm doing this for two reasons. One, a consistent length of time isn't represented across all geographies, and thus care needs to be taken when comparing results between NWI project areas. And two, most but not all differences that you'll see are due to, to change. 
Um, so the figure that you'll see on this slide provides an example of the difference products for an area near Miami Lakes, Florida. Um, the GIF is cycling through images showing what this area looked like when NWI data were originally created and what this area looks like now. I think it's pretty obvious which, which is which. Um, and then you'll also see the difference product. And on the difference product, you'll see areas that were originally mapped by NWI um, as a wetland uh, in green, areas where wetland has been converted to impervious in red, areas where vegetated wetland has changed to open water in light blue, and upland areas that have changed to open water in dark blue. Next slide, please. Um, so in this, in this slide, you can see that we've created these products for the nation. Um, and these are some example areas where we found the greatest amount of difference. Next slide, please. So we're also using new technologies to support more rapid cost-effective NWI data production through the automated creation of critical ancillary data sets. So what you see in this slide is an example of one. Um, it is a subpixel water fraction data set, um, which we've produced for multiple months and years for an area in Alaska. Um, areas that contain more inundation are blue, and areas without inundation are orange. Um, and this ancillary in information on, on inundation dynamics supports a more rapid and accurate determination of wetland boundaries and types. And it's especially critical in places like Alaska, where less is known about those landscape scale hydrologic dynamics. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, the NWI wetland status and trends and um, geospatial data sets are the monitoring and mapping components of NWI. These efforts are distinct, but both help to meet our nation's need for foundational landscape scale wetland data, and both have a long history of catalyzing wetland conservation. Our program's primary challenge has and still is supporting high quality contemporary data sets with a declining budget. To address this challenge, we work closely with partners to leverage resources and to build more efficient workflows. We very much look forward to working with you to best meet your wetland data information needs. And if you have any questions um, in the future, just don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm sorry for not including my email um, on this slide. I'm sure Jeremy can send it out later or um, you can find it on the NWI website. And that's it from me, Jeremy. There's one final slide. Great, thanks, Megan. The official thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for this great and comprehensive uh, coverage for NWI. Um, just for everyone else, you go again, if you came in later, if you have questions that you want to ask uh, Megan or Greg, we'll try to handle those in the Q&A, although we do have quite a few questions that I'd like to bring up here. In a little bit, um, but you can, if you use your cursor and scroll down to the bottom of the screen, a little bar will pop up. And there's a, a bubble there that says Q&A. And so you can drop your question in there and we will do our best to get to it. Although we do have quite a lot of questions. So I'm gonna take a few moments just to kind of, to wrap up what we're looking at here before we jump into, uh, into the Q&A, mostly in terms of direct application utilization. I mentioned earlier, that I was just using the NWI macro early, earlier today. Um, so just doing a quick functional comparison, looking at NWCI, ver, NWCA versus NWI. Basically with NWCA, we're looking at the condition of ecological characteristics. So what's the biology, the physical, and the chemical? Um, and then of course the goals are with doing this project every five years, um, into the foreseeable future, pending funding, of course, is that we're looking to see those changes over time. And, um, and then with NWI, you know, we've of course got that split into the two different channels that Megan leaned into in her conversation with us here today, uh, looking at status and trends. What are the changes in wetland type or impervious surfaces um, over time? Where are the losses? Where are the gains? Um, versus the geospatial data sets 
being in specific to being able to download the information that might help to refine the scope of a project or to help realign a project so that we're uh, avoiding the most amount of sensitive uh, areas as possible. Utilization comparison. NWCA's direct purpose more than anything other than just the general conditions looking at it from a scientific perspective are really designed to help shape policy. It's really designed also to shape how these wetlands are being managed from a national level. So looking at that from the perspective of macro scale, how can we, how can we improve how we're uh, overlooking the management and policy in relationship to it? And then with NWI, we're looking at direct application for planning, for infrastructure, for potential impacts or changes to the physical environment. But then that of course also helps to inform policy, especially since a lot of those data sets are being utilized to support NWCA efforts. Um, and then of course, direct utilization by the industry, by federal agencies, state agencies, regional agencies, and uh, for myself and many of those of you who are on here with us today from the environmental consulting and engineering uh, part of this industry, being able to look and see how projects may impact waters of the United States or state or isolated waters. Um, so last thing I wanna leave you with here is just like the importance of this ecosystem that we're looking at. I haven't brought this slide up in webinars in quite a while, but the importance of looking at how GIS software, stuff like QGIS and what Esri are doing, field applications, things like uh, field maps and Ecobot, GPS receivers, GNSS receivers that allow that sub-meter accurate development, the satellites that allow us to catch all this information, and then the, the data warehousing of data sets that allow us to pool from these data sets to make better decisions. It all comes back to biology and what's actually on the ground, but as most of you know, in the 21st century, so much depends on digital data and they, that is going to help shape the future. It's going to help shape the future of our policy, of conservation, of responsible uh, development, as well as sustainable economic development. So I just wanna leave you with this last slide before we transition out of our presentation here. We're very excited about what we've been able to do with Ecobot and our partnerships with many of the, uh, many of the folks who are joining us here on the panel today, but we have uh, crossed 47,000 sample points in the United States in the last couple of years. And so very excited again, this is important, important information that is going to help shape our future. Um, so what we wanted to do to transition into the Q&A and uh, Cameron, if you could go ahead and open that up is we wanna hear from you. We wanna, so you should see a little window in front of you that's gonna allow you to make a vote here. And basically we're just, there's three questions in here. Um, and if you could just take a moment and respond to those, um, that will be really helpful for, um, for all of us on this panel here today. In the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, proceed forward with the presentation, but you should still be able to answer the uh, answer that poll as, as you will. So if, uh, answers are coming in now, this is great. Um, in January, we're gonna be taking a deeper look at some of the challenges and successes of four of four assumptions in the three states that have assumed, uh, have assumed the uh, regulation of waters of the United States. And so um, the date is still to be determined probably towards the latter end of the month, route, probably most likely on the 26th, but we will be getting that information out to you. We're still waiting to hear from the various regulators and consultants who are going to be joining us as presenters and panelists for that particular conversation. So with that in mind, thank you for listening into our presentation portion of it. We've got about 10 minutes. We probably will stick around for a little bit of time afterwards just so that, because there's so many great questions that have come in. So um, we will go ahead and transition now. And I'm going to close my screen share so that we can see 
everyone. Let's see here. There we go. All right. So yeah, so if everyone from the panel and presenters, if you wouldn't mind bringing your lovely selves forward. And, uh, you know, again, we've got a lot of questions. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to handle all of these. Um, I've been noting on here that we would uh, uh, answer all of them. <laughs> this is a lot of questions. So very exciting. Obviously, this is a very exciting topic for everyone. So one of the things that I heard in both Megan and Greg's presentations um, had to do with where the future of this is going. Where is, uh, where is funding from this coming from? Where could funding potentially be coming from this? And then Judy Burns asked a great question in the QA panel. Thank you, Judy, for queuing that up. And so, um, Rob, I wanted to go ahead and invite you and to, uh, you know, with, with what you're doing with Ducks Unlimited and some of your partnership um, or as a partner with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, what are, what are some of the things that you're working on in respect to funding and NWI mapping? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Um, just as a little bit of a background, Dex Limited has been using NWI since it started. It's a super important layer for us to do our conservation planning. Um, we use it a lot in, in our waterfall habitats, um, duck energies, figuring out where the, where the ducks are, um, and also planning for um, future projects for conservation of, uh, of wetlands. So it's a really important layer for us. Um, we've used it um, forever. Um, we realize it's, a, it's an excellent layer to use, but it's also kind of out of date. And so a lot of times we want more uh, relevant information as far as, as time goes. Um, you know, using data that's 20, 30 years old is, is good, but it's not as good as it can be because the wetlands change. Um, and so what we, we've started last year, we started a coalition for NWI. Uh, really, we're working with our Ducks Unlimited policy folks, um, as well as other uh, folks in the coalition um, from industry, uh, from nonprofits, from organizations, really to try and raise awareness for the National Wetlands Inventory. Um, what we'd really like to do is, is get that $3.4 million that NWI gets every year is and bump that up to like $15 million uh, so we can have a complete update of NWI in the next 10 years. Uh, so that's our goal is to try and have a complete update, including Alaska, um, getting Alaska um, done as well. It's a really important layer for us and we really wanna make sure that this layer gets updated in the future. Uh, so that's why we started the coalition for NWI um, in order to try and advocate for um, increased funding for the NWI program so we can have a contemporary updated wetlands layer that everyone can use. Great. And so Megan, I want to I want to swing over to you on this same subject because I'd say half the questions that are coming in are asking about updates to NWI for specific states, etc. So um, uh, yeah, would you mind addressing that a little bit and where things are going? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, basically the budget that we have, um, which has been functionally decreasing through time, you know, is spent mainly um, on, on staff and the mapper. You know, we don't have much left over for, for wetlands projects. So we rely on partners. Uh, and so if you want to know if your state or geographic region um, will have new data soon, or if you just want to find out how old data is um, within your study area, you can look at our projects mapper, and I'm looking at it now. Um, I can tell you that you're going to see that a lot of the West is being updated. I believe that is um, BLM funding uh, that Lindsay, um, you know, Lindsay's, Lindsay's group um, has been largely responsible for. Um, so you'll see a lot of the, the west of CONUS being updated. You also see a lot of Alaska being updated, um, but it's not just the west and Alaska. You'll see um, big chunks of Michigan being updated. New Hampshire was just updated. Um, North Dakota, um, some big, pretty big chunks in Florida. Um, so I, I don't want to go on too much in terms of details, but just if you want that information, please just go to our website and you can see um, where we are going to soon provide updates. And um, if you work with an organization 
um, or a government entity that's interested in doing updates, I would encourage you to get in touch, you know, with us, um, and we can work with you to to make that happen. But like I said, um, it it would it's very challenging for us to do that, you know, just by ourselves. We simply don't have those resources, so we we do need to partner. So reach out to us. Great, thank you, Megan. So that's a great segue over to you, Lindsay. What you know. Uh, Megan just kind of opened up the uh, the table there a little bit for you, but what are you, what are you doing in the western states for updating wetlands and the almost three hundred thousand acres you all are managing? Yeah, so my name is Lindsay. I'm from the Bureau of Land Management, and um, we're really interested in wetland management and and riparian management. And we use the National Wetlands Inventory. Um, extensively to understand wetlands on our landscape. Um, so we're really interested in the quality of the data and um, getting updates uh, where possible. And so we've been involved um, in an initiative uh, fr coming from BLM to help fund updated mapping in, in our 13 Western states where, where it's needed. Um, and so we've been trying to find um, funding and, and little nooks and crannies at the end of the year to help fund uh, contracts to get those uh, those mapping areas updated. So we've been working with Megan and um, Fish and Wildlife, as well as um, contractors to to get those um, that mapping done. So we're so yeah, the short short answer is we're we're just like ducks and other folks who look at these data on large landscapes to understand the resource. Um, we're keenly interested in, in the quality of the data and so have been uh, involved in, in trying to get those updated uh, where, where we work as BLM, so. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Lindsay. Um, and so uh, the other thing, of course, that's really important in the longevity of what we're looking at here is how we can better improve our data sets also through predictive modeling, looking at where things could be shaped based on what we know from the field. So Gina, I know with your, uh, your, your WIM tool that you've developed in uh, Esri that you have been working in collaboration with NWI on some, some trying to improve some of those data sets. Can you uh, share a little bit about what you're doing with that? Sure. Um, so WIM or the wetland identification model is a framework that's part of the Arc Hydro tool set that um, in its base or it's a framework for predicting where wetlands are most likely to be in the landscape given some remote sensing data. Um, and there's, you know, that's in itself a very rich research area um, using remote sensing to predict wetlands. Um, and WIM and its baseline functionality looks at topographic factors. So those surface hydrologic drivers of wetland formation. Um, and yeah, we are actively developing WIM and um, trying to figure out how we can make it a more useful tool for NWI's larger goal of creating these better, faster, cheaper wetlands. So specifically, um, how can WIM or similar predictive frameworks be used to take all of that ancillary data that can be used for photo interpretation and give you one kind of distilled form of it um, that photo interpreters can use more efficiently or to directly use some predicted wetland locations as a starting point that photo interpreters can use um, as a starting point to go and refine boundaries or to go in and start to classify wetlands. Great, and then Megan, is there anything that you would wanna to add to that? I would just say that again, you know, partnerships are, are just so important, um, you know, not just for um, updates using our um, existing protocols, but um, in terms of developing our workflows into the future. And we are, you know, really pleased to be working with um, Gina, with Esri, um, and uh, additional colleagues at other federal agencies, uh, including USGS, um, as well as universities to chart the kind of technical direction of NWI uh, moving forward. Great. So I just want to note it is the end of our hour. I am going to uh, stick around if any of you, uh, both on the panel as well as uh, participants, can stick around. Again, we do have a lot of other questions. We will not get to all of them. Uh, we won't roll over for more than 10 minutes. But before anybody goes, 
he can stick around Cameron, if he can bring up the results from the poll, I think that'd be really interesting for everyone to see, taking a look at how NWI geodata spatial set, geospatial data sets um, support organizations. Um, and while, while you're taking a look at that, you can use your own uh, bar to scroll through there and take a look um, at some of those results. In the meantime, um, this, is, this is a webinar that we're planning on doing annually. So probably sometime next fall or winter, we will revisit this so that we can see some additional updates. So please stay tuned for that for next year. Um, yeah, really interesting results here. Megan, and I'm sure we can probably create some sort of output from this that we can uh, share with other folks. What I do want to do is there was a great question that came in from Jody to uh, for, in relationship to NWCA. Um, so, so let's see where'd that go, Jody? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This was from Frank Norman. Um, so, Greg. And this is for you, you know, what are some of the take home lessons that EPA is picking up from the uh, 2011, 2016 and 2021 monitoring efforts? And uh, would you like for more, for, would you like no, participants I, <laughs> to tell more people about NWCA? Yeah. No, and that was a great question. And, and first, uh, uh, so thank you, Frank. And um, and I did want to note that there are a lot of people on uh, this call. It, it uh, seems that have, um, like yourself, Jeremy, you've actually done some sampling for NWCA, and Frank's been someone who's been involved uh, really from the start. So, um, and it's a little difficult, I think. The front. Uh, so one thing is NWCA is we we're now um, we just finished our third uh, survey. We've been doing this for ten years. Uh, I think people are jumping at the bits, ready for. Like what have you found? What you know? What are the um, the main results? Like what 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 is the condition of our wetlands? And we've got you know results from 2011. We're working on results from 2016. Uh, it's going to take time to really be able to um, tease out you know what is happening with our wetlands. What is the, What's their overall quality? How um, and what things can we do in the world of policy and management to start to affect change so that we um, so that any trends that we're finding, we can we can see whether um, there are things that we can do, actions that we can take that will address some of the some of the issues. Um, we are, you know, so in our first survey in 2011, we found that about 50% of wetlands are in good condition, which I think in some ways is, uh, is, is maybe surprising. We know that wetlands are uh, around the landscape really have a variety of threats. Um, and so, um, so on one hand, that, that seems like it might be a, that kind of high and like, well, okay, that's not horrible. <laughs> like 50% have really good vegetation uh, communities. Um, but the flip side is that it is it is less than 50%, right? So ideally, we'd really like um, a much higher number of our wetlands to be in good quality. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, so, yeah, so I, yeah, the take home message is, is a little, is, is, is maybe a little mixed. Um, and then, and then obviously, it is, even though it's something that we've been doing for 10 years, it's going to take us time to really start to come up with data that's going to be able to drive policy and management. And that's something that's, um, that I think is frustrating because uh, you, you would like to be able to say something right away. Um, the other thing um, that I just want to mention is that we've got a lot of data. So we've got, um, you know, a tremendous amount of data for specific sites in terms of vegetation and soil. Um, it's really an extensive data set. We've only really touched the surface, I think, of what you can do with the data in terms of our analysis. So a take home message for me to everyone is to really, um, is to look at the data if you're a scientist, if you're a researcher, if you're in an academic setting, um, please, we'd love for you to, to um, take a look at those data sets. As I said, we, we put them up um, to 2011 and 2016 data are there. We'll be, um, we'll be hopefully getting the 2021 data up 
on a much shorter turnaround. Um, we're developing tools right now that allow um, that will allow people to explore and visualize the data in really we hope really meaningful ways, and that'll help help drive uh, further analysis and, and sort of exploration of the data. Um, so I don't want to take too, too much time. I, I I'm not sure I answered all of uh, Frank's. That was quite a quite of an extensive set of questions uh, I saw. Yeah. So. Anyway, uh, Jeremy, I'll let you moderate. And great, yeah, I think we got the heart of it. I wanted to lean over to you, Rob, and see, you know, like with from an NGO perspective, like what what do you guys see when you're looking at different landscapes? What are you seeing boots on the ground um, from remote sensing perspective? Like, are you seeing kind of similar level of potential degradation of wetlands across the United States as these as EPA is getting back from NWCA? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I consider myself boots on the ground anymore, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's just a tremendous change in, in wetlands, especially with um, now the climate effects we're seeing in the, in the prairies, um, with the amount of water there or too much water, not enough water. Um, so just the changes in wetlands we're seeing um, is pretty dramatic. And so having data sets like what Greg has with conditions, knowing what the conditions are, um, knowing where the really pristine wetlands are um, is super important, um, as well as the ones that we can do, do work on to enhance those wetlands and, and make them better in the future. So all this data is super, super important for us as we're looking at where to do restoration efforts and where to do protection efforts. Great, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to pivot over to, you know, kind of wrap things up, Megan, who made a great suggestion, um, some of the questions, we can try to curate those off and create sort of like a Q&A sheet um, that maybe some of the folks here on the panel could help with um, after we wrap up. Um, some of the questions that were coming up, just to kind of pivot off what you were talking about there, Rob, is change is inevitable in the uh, landscape. You know, you change hydrology a little bit, you change a little bit of the, the morphology of the landscape, water moves in slightly different direction. Uh, some lands are abandoned, become woody. Uh, we see changes over time. So some of the questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A box right now are in respect to almost like citizen science or consulting or regulators are out on the ground and again, like this is what we're seeing with a lot of the Ecobot data. It's like all these points all over the map that give us a better idea of how things are shaped. Um, and so uh, I think I would want to start with you, Megan, here is, you know, what is the possibility of looking at how some of the boots on the ground science could potentially help improve NWI mapper? I'm so glad you asked that question because I saw it was a frequent question. So it's best to just handle it all at once. Um, so I'd say in terms of how our data management is set up, we aren't set up to take, um, you know, individual edits or individual data from small parcels um, because our project areas are much larger. That said, it seems like a direction that we would strongly want to consider moving in the future. And I do believe that um, some of the um, new technologies that are out there might enable us to do so, at least to, to benefit um, from this delineation data. So for example, um, Gina and Jeremy and others of us have talked about whether or not we can pull in field data um, gathered from a variety of different places to help to train or calibrate automated products um, that can be used in support of NWI. I think that's something that's probably um, achievable, right? We can, we can work towards. Um, but I also believe that as a program, NWI needs to think about whether or not we can change our data management system to accommodate, um, you know, suggestions from, from numerous small, you know, for numerous small parcels um, across the U.S. It's something that I think would be beneficial. 
Um, but to be honest, you know, take some staff time and we are so limited in staff time. So we need to see if we can do it in an efficient way. Um, and I'd like to look into that in the future. Yeah, great. Um, I, I guess, so what I wanna do is kind of move us towards wrapping up here. Um, and so what I'd love to do is just invite everyone to make some closing remarks in respect to our subject material today. Again, uh, we will look to get the other Q&A uh, published and uh, listed it as available online resource for those of you who did not get your questions answered today. Um, but uh, so yeah, to, to close this out, why don't I, Lindsay, why don't we go over to you and see, you know, like, what would you want to leave us with and what is most important for you in respect to NWI and NWCA? Well, just briefly, I'm, I'm really encouraged and excited to see the work, uh, the continuing work by NWI and, and Megan and the good folks over there and all the mappers out there who are helping update the data um, and thinking about, you know, the tools, remote sensing, as well as field data, QC processes and these different pieces of information that we can pull in um, to, to inform uh, what, you know, our understanding of wetlands in the landscape. Um, first of all, so we're really excited to see all that happening and moving forward and, and looking forward to staying abreast of that. And um, as an agency, uh, we're rolling out a wetland monitoring program that will be fully implemented this year for the first time. So we'll have some of those um, field data available going forward um, into future years as well. And so I'm looking forward to uh, coordinating with EPA and, and uh, Greg's um, National Wetland Condition Assessment, uh, you know, his work at a national scale, our work um, on our Western lands um, will all help inform these larger efforts at, at a landscape scale. So uh, yeah, really exciting work and uh, thanks for organizing. Yeah, you bet, Lindsay, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, so Rob? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy, and thanks for, for putting this presentation on. Um, I guess what I'd like to leave everyone with is, is the importance of these data sets and the importance of continued funding for these data sets in the future um, so we can all utilize this data. Unfortunately, sometimes data and gathering data is not, to, not the sexy thing that people want to see, but it's extremely important and, and goes into developing a lot of different applications. So um, just the continued support of these data sets um, in the future is, I think, going to be critical. So. If anybody's interested in helping out on the coalition, let me know. Uh, we welcome support to, to support these, these at the government level and make sure they continue in the future. So thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you, Rob. And certainly looking forward to working in sync with you and the coalition moving forward. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, Greg. Yeah, I just, um, so I think, I do want to stress, I'd mentioned a little bit in my talk, but um, NWCA relies critically on the NWI. So, um, so efforts to, um, to update it, keep it current, um, and have it be a really um, just valuable data set um, with the sort of updates that they're contemplating is, gonna, is critically important uh, to NWCA. We, we spend a lot of time evaluating um, sites and that takes away a little bit from other, other efforts that we could do. So, um, so one, it's just, you know, we couldn't do our project without the NWI. And I want to thank Fish and Wildlife Service for everything they've done over the course of the last 40, 50 years to get us to where we are now. Uh, and then any support that can be um, provided to, to help, you know, keep those data sets current um, and, and in really good shape is, is um, critically important to us. Uh, the other thing is just is um, you know mentioning again that the sort of the data sets that we've got, and uh, we're really excited uh, to be um, to have the, the data come in from BLM as well. Uh, one of the things that we found in our first survey uh, was that we we didn't have enough sites across the West, and so the fact that BLM is, is, is doing and started this initiative to assess their, the, the lands they manage uh, in an area where we don't have much um, data is just is also going to be amazing. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to sort of seeing that data. And then lastly, just encourage everyone to check out our data sets and, uh, and, and really um, and use them for, for whatever purpose they, they seem um, 
or that, that they might be applicable for. And Greg, would you mind sending the easiest access link to that so that we can put that in the material from? Yeah, let me send that. Uh, it was in my slide, um, but I can just send it. You want me to send it in chat or Q&A? Uh, just send it to me via email when we complete, and then we'll just put it in okay. that document for everyone. Um, okay. Yeah, so Megan, you want to close out as well? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, thanks. Thanks to everyone again. Um, thanks to Ecobod and um, thanks to all the panelists. I, I really feel um, privileged to be part of this, this great webinar and this great team. Um, you know, also privileged to be part of this community, this wetlands community um, that all of us are, are part of. And I again wanted to stress the importance of partnerships. Um, you know, partnerships are going to be critical for conserving wetlands and the benefits that they provide us. And partnerships are going to be critical for, um, you know, maintaining the information that allows us um, to conserve, um, you know, wetlands uh, as a valuable resource that they are. Um, so I just wanted to thank you very much, um, everyone for your participation in this webinar. Um, and to again, emphasize that um, we greatly appreciate your, your feedback. We are very much open to it. Um, and that does not end today. I would encourage you to, to reach out um, and I, I, you know, if I don't get back immediately, I, I will get back to you. Um, so thank you in advance um, for your for your insights. Great, thank you, Megan. And Gina had to leave early; she couldn't stick around for the extra Q and A time. She had another meeting to attend, but she said to say thank you to everyone. Um, we had over 150 people in attendance today. Um, super exciting that there's this much interest in these data sets. Um, I wanted to thank Society of Wetland Scientists for helping stitch a lot of us together over the years. And uh, hopefully some of you can join us for the annual meeting this coming year in 2022. We've got some great symposium coming up around that. But otherwise, thank you all for sticking around late. For those of you who did, please go enjoy the rest of your afternoon or whatever it is, wherever you are in the world. And uh, we will put together the results as uh, from the uh, poll that we ran um, into that uh, that information that will be available to people post registration too. So thank you all again for coming, Rob, Lindsay, Greg, Megan, and Gina. Thank you for being a part of this today. Really enjoyed it and look forward to collaborating with you all in the future. All right. So that's going to close us out. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy.